Hey everyone, in all the different places that you are, it is June 8th, uh, and I am in rural central Virginia. So it's, you know, mid, mid to late, creeping into, sorry, early to mid, creeping into mid-June. It's been an intense month, it's been an intense few months, just gonna admit that here, I think we're all feeling it. Um, you know, we're in the middle of a global pandemic in general. We're in a very intense wave of the anti-racism movement here in the United States right now. The temperatures are getting into the 90s. Uh, summer is pretty much here. So tensions can be high. I'll admit this has been a time when I have um, been emotionally challenged, been going into freeze, overwhelm. I feel like in our time right now, um, there's fear, there's panic. Um, it can be a testing, a testing time. So it's just, <laughs> I'm inviting myself and all of us to take a breath from that right now um, and tell you about where I am. So I'm in the middle of a large uh, meadow, kind of an old field, an old farm field of a small farmhouse gone fallow, uh, so turning into a meadow. Um, it is bright and sunny and hot today. I'm in a field of white clover, as you can see, underneath a grove, a rich, thick grove of American persimmon trees. Um, and looking out here, um, the plants being in summer mode right now, most of the plants here being uh, shoulder high, um, all the wild greens and herbs. Um, I'm going to focus on one today, and that's lamb's quarters. Um, but as I look out over this, uh, just eyeballing it, maybe it's an acre that I'm looking at right now of open, sunny, fallow field. Um, so much of it right now is this one plant, lamb's quarters. So let's just take a look at what that looks like. So as you can see, you know, here's part of this once garden, once field area. It's very thick with growth this time of year. Um, there's my house. Uh, as you can see, in much of this area, white clover is a ground cover coming up on its own. Thick, I mean almost knee-high white clover. Yellow dock is very, very abundant here can see how tall you can see that it's starting to rise how tall it's getting now that summertime is here and honestly throughout here <laughs> we could probably pick out 50 amazing edible medicinal ancestral plant foods and medicines that are all coming up of their own accord with no cultivation um this is actually an amazing little spot of a cilantro coming up on its own. Um, but I really want to focus on this area here. You can see all these white daisies in the background blooming, wild daisies. And here, um, though this plant is all throughout the property, there's an especially thick meadow of this amazing plant, lamb's quarters, here. Let's take a close look. It is very bright out here. So here we go. There's a sweet little lamb's quarters. And as you may or may not be able to tell, this plant is about hip high for me right now, quite tall. And this is a very common plant. You should be easily able to find this plant in your field guides online. Um, but what we are noticing, botanically, are opposite, or sorry, alternating leaves, meaning one leaf is coming out on the joint here, the next leaf is coming out on the opposite side of the stem at a gap, alternating up the stalk. Um, lamb's quarters also has this funny thing, it almost has stripes on the stalk a lot, red and green stripes. 
and ribs. It almost feels ribbed as you move your fingers around it. The leaves tend to be green, um, and the young leaves, particularly on the bottom, have this white, mealy, <laughs> it's like substance on the bottom, and when you rub it off, it, it comes off. See that? Uh, it might You might think it's a bug or a pest. It's, it's not. That's just part of the leaf. That's how lamb's quarters are. Um, so that's part of them. And let's just take a look at the expanse. Okay, so here we go. See here? Basically an endless sea of <laughs> lamb's quarters. All about uh, hip high on me. Some higher than hip high, waist high. It's basically endless. It's basically endless and much has already been harvested and taken out to make space for other gardens. So truly a lot of lamb's quarters. Okay. So I want to just show you this spread here to, you know, let's just take a step back really and just take in the fact that here on planet earth, <laughs> on this soil where humans have not tended it, you know, since last, last year, this edible green is growing in utter abundance. I mean, this is enough greens to feed a hundred people. And it's growing of its own accord, you know, in a time when the world can feel stressful, when there are food shortages, when there's food pressures, when people are feeling stressed. Let's accept this, you know. Um, plants so often called weeds. Let's remember that any plant you can point to and say, oh, that's a, that's a noxious weed. Um, that's something that shouldn't be here. Just remember that for someone, that plant is an ancient ancestral food or medicine for them. At some point in history, in their DNA, in their bones, that has been a sacred and important ancestral food or medicine or material um, that their ancestors would have made an extremely important part of their life and very important for their survival and thrival. So let's remember that. Um, I'm going to switch the camera back. So, lamb's quarters. This is the common name, only one common name for this plant. Other common names are things like goosefoot, wild spinach. There's many different common names for this plant. And, uh, but the botanical name, Chenopodium album. That spelling will be in the video details uh, below. Chenopodiums, okay, the genus of this plant, Chenopodiums, are amaranths. They're in the amaranth family, the amaranth, amaranth they say, eh? Um, and here's what's interesting. Chenopodiums of different species and many different subspecies, um, it's unique that I can say this about a chenopodium, about a plant, um, is that for most people, <laughs> um, uh, wherever your ancestry comes from, wherever your ancestors come from, for most people, a chenopodium will have been an ancestral food for your, your DNA, your ancestors, um, because this is such a widespread plant. And um, if not this particular species, uh, another species. So chenopodiums and humans go way back in ancient times, okay? So whether your ancestors originated from North America, uh, with chenopodiums, in particularly North America, Europe, and Asia, although nowadays chenopodiums are so widespread all over the planet on pretty much every, I think on actually every continent, um, it's unclear even among botanists, like, <laughs> where did these plants originate from? Have they always been everywhere? Um, and part of that, part of that may just be um, that humans have moved them around so much because they're such a valuable human food. So when we think of amaranths, 
Um, there are many different kinds of amaranths, but in general, when we're thinking about amaranth plants in a food way, we're thinking about one, edible greens. So the greens as a vegetable, a very highly nutritious and generally very mild tasting uh, cooked vegetable or in, in, in many instances, a raw green also. So we're thinking about a cooked green and then we're also thinking about the seed as a grain, as a grain food. Um, think about, you know, quinoa is, is an amaranth, um, uh, amaranth seed, um, which you can cook as a grain, which you can mill into a flour, into a powder. Very, very ancient food for humans pretty much all over the planet, okay? So, <laughs> even if you don't think you know lamb's quarters, your bones probably know it, your DNA probably knows it. So, this particular Chenopodium, Chenopodium album, is so abundant these days, um, at least here in the southeast and mid-Atlantic of North America, it's an extremely abundant wild-growing plant. It, you'll notice it in the summertime, so I'm mentioning it now, which is really its prime time. Um, I will also just mention, um, you know, I did, it did come to my attention, thanks to anyone who follows or um, learns from uh, an amazing place called Mountain Jewel Sanctuary uh, in Missouri, I believe. But Wren, uh, Wren and Innie uh, run this beautiful sanctuary. Wren did some amazing tinkering of research into um, Chenopodiums. I don't know, this was about a month or two ago. So uh, worth following them on Facebook, checking them out. Um, they can direct you towards that interesting research um, of numerous archaeological caches of food, plant foodstuffs in North America um, in what is present day um, the United States and also Canada. Um, so archaeological finds of uh, food stores um, which tell scientists what were humans eating in that area 2,000 years ago. And one of the plants found in those caches is chenopodiums. Okay, so just, <laughs> I'm just giving you a context. Ancient, ancient human food. What's even more interesting is that it's likely that those chenopodiums were cultivated, um, had become cultivated strains of a wild chenopodium, meaning that people planted it on purpose, cultivated it for certain uh, qualities, um, because they valued it so much, very likely. So, incredible. I'm inviting you to value this plant just as much as you would value spinach or lettuce. Uh, actually, more so. <laughs> it's a plant that's more nutritious, more hardy, and more abundant. So, um, this plant is, I consider it um, one of my main greens, dominant edible greens of the summertime. Okay, in the spring, I really mentioned chickweed, uh, Stellaria media, because it is, I consider it the dominant mild tasting edible green of spring here in the southeast and mid-Atlantic. Okay, in summer, the mild tasting wild green uh, I consider to be lamb's quarters. Okay, so you won't even see it coming up uh, until the weather gets quite warm. You know, chickweed will have already died back and lamb's quarters will be coming up. And at first it will be quite small, but it will, the leaves will look the same. Depending on where it's growing, you know, it can get knee high, it can get waist high, it can get shoulder high. Um, but it's often my main summertime green, whether I'm, you know, just harvesting it wild or whether I am encouraging it in my garden, which I almost always am, in the same way I would encourage chickweed. Okay, um, so right now, uh, lamb's quarters is leafy. Okay, this is all leafy growth. It hasn't started to flower yet. Uh, the flowering, I guess that's a spike, spike will have an amaranthy look, kind of this little spire, this little little tower on top. Um, and then it will form seeds, 
um, and that will be a second crop food source. So later in the summer, autumn, this plant will stop being a green vegetable and will then be a grain. Okay, so right now is the time to appreciate lamb's quarters as a green vegetable and to just really go for it. So right now, this year, something I'm focusing a lot on myself is the simplicity of drying foods, uh, plants, animal, whatever, uh, particularly sun drying foods. Um, this year I happen to be very fortunate to be living in this beautiful meadow in this beautiful rural area with some other beautiful um, nature loving <laughs> uh, wild folks who uh, are as passionate about uh, uh, land relationships as I am in their own wacky way. So most of us here on the property are focusing on drying lamb's quarters leaves to store for winter, a winter food, um, as well as other things. <laughs> um, sun drying a bunch of mulberries right now is an experiment. Um, and I'll show a little bit of that more later. But I just, I invite you to feel free and open to, if you have an abundance, this is a great plant to store um, for this coming winter. And in any in other ways too, you know, you could freeze it, things like that. But the simplicity of drying works uh, wonderfully with this food. So uh, I'm going to show you how I harvest this plant and how to kind of tend it as a semi-cultivated plant. So here we go. So here we are back in the meadow. <laughs> Over there on the deck there's some folks likely working on stringing up lamb's quarters to dry in the sun. That deck has been a great spot to be sun drying foods. So I'm going to use my own shadow to be able to uh, show you in better focus what I'm going to talk about. So here's a beautiful lamb's quarters here. Already quite tall. Like I said, most of these are uh, hip high on me right now. Obviously, you can you can start harvesting uh, this plant when it is you know only a few inches tall. You don't have to wait till it's this, this high. So here's what I do with lamb's quarters. The same as I do with pretty much any other plant. I'm a big, <laughs> I'm a big fan of meristem. Uh, and if you're not sure what that is, you can watch my earlier video in the spring called Lessons in Meristem and Heartbreak. In short, meristem is the young tender growth of any plant, which tends to be the edible vegetable. Like an asparagus, think of an asparagus shoot in the spring. Bright green, it snaps easily. It's tender to chew, it's digestible and assimilatable. So that's how we eat most plants as humans. So with lamb's quarters, even though this plant is at least three feet tall, I tend to personally prefer just to nip the top, top few inches. Okay, so that's the whole, the whole stem. I'm not picking off individual leaves here. You see the whole stem with the bundle of upper leaves attached to it. So that's typically what I'm going for. Putting it in my basket. Um, and the wonderful thing about lamb's quarters is that I encourage you to treat it like a tea bush. Treat it like a tea plant and that you're constantly nipping the new growth. And you can essentially encourage it to become a bush. This is an annual plant. Uh, make no mistake, this isn't going to be around for years. It will come back every year from seed, but this plant being so tall, so even if I snapped it way down here, that would be a great thing to do because this plant is going to shoot out new tender growth now from multiple nodes, from multiple joints, and it will start to become more bush-like. And then in a week I can come back and nip the tender little tips from other branches as they grow. And when I do this in my gardens, uh, they really do become these large, bushy plants that will provide more and more and more greens for you throughout the summer. Also, when you do this, when you're constantly nipping the tips, you're slowing down their growth. You're slowing down the speed at which the plant is going to flower and make seed. What I mean by that is, you know, if I nip these plants and keep nipping them, uh, nipping all the branches as they uh, return, these particular plants will flower a bit later than if I had not nipped them. 
That means I have a longer harvest season of the greens before the plants bloom and go to seed. So that's a really great thing to do. So even though these plants are so tall, you know, I might even like break it way down here just to now encourage this to become bushy. And then on this particular stalk, um, you know, some folks like to just eat all the leaves from a stalk. All the leaves do tend to actually be tender. Um, what a lot of folks here are doing is actually harvesting whole stalks like this, stringing them up on strings, you know, hundreds of them, and sun drying them, and then stripping the dried leaves from the stalks to store the dried leaves uh, for food. Um, I personally tend to just like the tips, and then I'm drying lots and lots of the tips. But even in a branch like this, you can see there's um, other branching here where there's a little tender tip here, so I can break that off. So even on one stalk, there can be five or six or more little tender tips for me to harvest. That's up to you. Again, I like just the top, the top bits. So um, that's what I'm doing. <laughs> and I'm, you know, gathering a whole basket full. So this is kind of a form of interacting with uh, cultivating a wild plant. And, you know, every day I come out here and I harvest more. And I, uh, every night I'm eating these with every meal. I'm just throwing them into my stir fries, um, kind of like spinach. Or eating them raw in salads. They're extremely versatile. This is why I always mention mild greens because you can pretty much do whatever you want with them cooking wise they're going to turn out great bake them fry them dry them eat them raw marinate them seriously anything you can think to do with spinach put them in a quiche my god really anything the sky's the limit and they have a nice meaty texture when they cook they don't get slimy or or shrink down too much like spinach they really hold hold a nice texture um, and then in salads, they're a nice base, and then you can add other spicy, spicy wild greens and bitters and berries and fruits and, you know, everything else to it as well. Um, so that's that. You know, I'm harvesting a lot to, to cook some tonight, and then the remainder I'm going to set out to dry. Um, and, yeah, let's take a little look at that. So here's just a small patch of lamb's quarters that I've already tended to a little bit, maybe yesterday or the day before, you can see how low I've nipped these. You know, I really broke the stalk low. And you can see that already um, these plants are starting to branch again quite a lot. So these are going to start to become bushy and more branching and create many, many more tender tips. Okay. So here's just a very non-fancy glimpse of some of the lamb's quarters that I've been drying uh, in my wall tent right now. Just to show you, like, you don't have to be precious about this. My god, I just lay out greens wherever you've got. Um, ideally, any space where they're not going to get dew on them in the morning. If it's indoors, like laying them out on a nice large sheet. If you have screens you can lay them out on, that's great. But you don't really have to be precious about it. You know, often I have, like, baskets full of them. Um just kind of all over the place. So you can see these have been drying for a couple days. Um, and I just kind of pile them into baskets um, and just kind of swish them around every day to make sure they've got air. So you can see these are starting to dry. All these little tips, not dry yet. And these other ones that tend to get a little bit of sun drying a little bit faster, but they're not there yet. One thing with lamb's quarters is that the leaves, even if you dry them in the shade, uh, the leaves do tend to yellow a little bit, and that's just a lamb's quarters thing, so don't worry about that. Um, a lot of folks here are drying the lamb's quarters in the full sun. That's great, too, just, you know, for a day or two. Like, once it's dry in the sun, take it inside, put it in jars or bags. Don't leave it out for, like, a week in the sun after it's already dried, or the sun is going to start to break it down too much. You know, like, bleach it, strip away all the goodness and the minerals and the vitamins. And then it'll all just turn like crispy brown, yellow. But a little bit of yellowing dried. When dried, I find to be very normal with lamb's quarters. Just so don't so don't worry about it. You didn't do anything wrong. Um, you, know, you can see that happening here. Just like a teeny bit of yellowing already happening. Um, yeah, that's it. And the great thing, I love doing this with stinging nettles. Um, many other... 
many other greens. This is great um, to just dry them once they're fully dried and crispy and crunchy. I'll, you know, crush a whole bunch of them, um, like in glass ball jars with tight lids, or I guess you could do like plastic bins or bags. Anything that's airtight is going to keep them, uh, they're going to last a long time that way. And then in the winter, whenever I want to make a stir fry or a soup, I just pull out some of those, it's especially good with nettles, pull out some of those dried greens and just throw it into whatever you're cooking. And they'll kind of reconstitute with the moisture of what you're cooking uh, and cook at the same time and get tender. And it's amazing how e how easy that is um, to store greens uh, for wintertime. And so easy to add to soups and things like that. And just make wintertime more rich and your food more rich. And, and get in wonderful vitamins and minerals. So there we go. That's the simple setup. I encourage you to give it a try. Hey everyone. So that's pretty much it for lamb's quarters right now. If you want to find more information about this plant, there's an abundance of it <laughs> in field guides, in books, and probably every um, resource on wild edible plants. Uh, it's as common as dandelion, often. And just another note that uh, any plant, wild plant, or cultivated that you harvest from, that you w want to stay in your life, um, you must let it flower and create seeds if you want it to come back the next year. Okay, so we got to get rid of this mentality of, oh, as soon as a plant is flowering and in seed and the greens aren't tender anymore, we just rip it out <laughs> and get rid of it. No, you know, every plant deserves to have its bloom time and its seed time. That's the precious time for every plant. That's that's what ensures the continuance of all life on planet Earth. That's what ensures the continuance of our lives as humans and all the animals. Okay, so the, the flowers are holy, the seeds are holy, even when the stalks look dead in the fields. The dead standing stalks in the wintertime, when to some people they look like a mess, that's where many, 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 many insects are uh, either spinning uh, cocoons um, to incubate or uh, creating their... Uh, egg cases okay so <laughs> the mature plants the plants after they're past their prime for eating for us humans it's very important to leave them or at least leave some okay and then they will spread drop their seeds and you will continue to have lambs quarters in your field or in your garden um, the next year and year after year they do only like sun, so you're going to find them in the hot places, the nice hot places. And in urban areas, they'll often be like near cement and concrete because um, they love the heat. They really like like the hot weather. Um, yeah, lamb's quarter, I feel like <laughs> chenopodiums are, they're a plant that can bring us together in our humanity a bit, right? Because we, most of us have this shared uh, ancestral heritage of relationship with these ancient amaranths. Um, so there's incredible beauty and diversity in uh, many different lineages and traditions and ancestral um, traditions and life ways of <laughs> the enormous diversity of humans on this earth. And uh, that has its incredible value. And then also the things that um, bring us together and make us the same in certain ways have great value too and I consider the ancient amaranths to be one of those things that that brings us together that unites us that shows us our sameness okay <laughs> I'm gonna cry <laughs> so there's amaranth uh, the sun is setting now I need to probably go move my mulberries into more sun and um, I hope this was helpful let me know if you have questions in the comments and hopefully there will be more fun videos and things to come. I'm excited about what this summer here is going to bring. Bye-bye, everybody.